The Corner Table is brought to you by the Cap Times Idea Fest. Two days of lively discussion on September 28th and 29th on the University of Wisconsin Madison campus. You can find tickets at captimesideafest.com. Sometimes breeders just need to know that chefs want a certain shape or a certain size in order to start looking for that. Michael Mazurek in New York, he is breeding acorn squash. And the chef said, well, what we really want is something with no ridges. We want it to be round because it's easier to process. And he said, well, basically, I've been throwing all those out because I thought everybody wanted ridges. Hello. Welcome to The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison, Wisconsin, produced by The Capital Times. Imagine lining up three dozen steamed beets, ranging in color from deep blood red to white. You look at each one and you smell it, and then you give it a few nibbles. Is it earthy? Sweet? Does it remind you of wet leaves? Solveig Hansen is a beet breeder, and she wants all the details you can think of for her beet flavor wheel. I am your host, Cap Times food writer Lindsay Christians. Julie Dawson leads the Seed to Kitchen project at UW-Madison, which pairs plant breeders like Solveig with farmers and chefs who can describe exactly what they want in a sweet pepper or a butternut squash. This week on the podcast, I talk with both of them about how to build a better beet and why sweeter is not always better. Give a listen. Solveig and Julie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, can you introduce yourselves to folks and tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure thing. Uh, my name is Solveig Hansen. I am a fourth year PhD student in uh, Dr. Erwin Goldman's horticulture lab. I'm studying plant breeding and plant genetics, uh, specifically beets and specifically the earthy flavor in beets, uh, where that flavor comes from, how we can manipulate it, and how we can use that manipulation along with uh, manipulation of color and uh, other flavors to create some new, interesting beet cultivars for the uh, Wisconsin local markets. When you say earthiness, you mean like the the dirt flavor in beets? Precisely. Um, (laughs) I would say the earthy flavor in beets or the taste like dirtness of beets is one of two major reasons people don't like them. And the other one is that somebody made them eat canned beets or uh, pickled beets. Um, at some point in their early life, and that was um, not not something they liked. But um, the earthy flavor is something that is frequently cited uh, by people as a reason they don't like beets. By decreasing that earthiness, we can potentially make beets that will be accessible or, or appealing to more people. By increasing it, we can achieve different flavor profiles that have been than have been out there before. And Julie. I'm Julie Dawson. I'm an assistant professor in horticulture at UW-Madison and the state extension specialist for urban and regional food systems. I coordinate a project called the Seed to Kitchen Collaborative, which is a group of farmers, chefs, and plant breeders in Wisconsin and really um, plant breeders from all over the country who are interested in developing varieties that have really excellent flavor, consistent quality, and adaptation to local, small-scale, diversified farms in the upper Midwest. With something like the event last week, the Seed to Kitchen event over at Four Quarter, you had a bunch of types of cucumbers with random letters on them. So we wouldn't be swayed by any names or details at all. It was just sort of cucumber in a bowl, right? Um, And then we also did a tasting of beets. Mm -hmm. When you have these chefs bringing them all in, what are you looking for from them? Because they're not just telling you, yes, we like the flavor of this. No, we don't. You're looking for more than that, right? Yes. So chefs are often able to articulate why they like something or how it can be changed to improve it better than I am or members of my crew are. We taste everything in our trials as a crew with some kind of very basic training on recognizing the different flavors. The chefs are able to give us more detail and provide some descriptive information that seed companies or plant breeders could use to kind of characterize what they're looking for. And they can also tell us what's missing And so that is helpful for breeders that are trying to steer their breeding program towards selecting for 
better overall flavor and maybe different um, culinary uses. It was interesting to hear about expectations around some of these things. Mm -hmm. There was one of the chefs that I talked to who was saying that like, there was a lot of disagreement about one particular cucumber that was kind of a drier texture. She was saying how it reminded her of a zucchini, and one chef was like, yeah, isn't that cool? And she was like, actually, no, because that's not what I was looking for in a cucumber. You know, is this a cool new option of like a way that you can use a vegetable that maybe you wouldn't have been able to before because it has these different characteristics? Or is it problematic because it's not what you expect? Right. And in that case, the key seems to be to present it, maybe with a variety name or with a term that a a farmer uses when selling it, that would cause the buyer to get what they're expecting. When I was farming, I was a farmer for about eight years before I did this whole school adventure, and we started growing Hakurai turnips, which are a a Japanese turnip that uh, are sweet and succulent, mature earlier, and you eat them fresh instead of cooking them like you do a purple top turnip. Most people thought they were radishes because they were that in that character. So we referred to them as salad turnips because people, by hearing that name, would say like, oh, this is something I chop up and put in the salad. I don't have to cook it for an hour like I do a regular turnip. So it's that, that kind of thing. Naming it something that helps the consumer know what to do with it. I was interested. You were, uh, Solveig, you were doing a, a beet flavor wheel. Yeah. (laughs) Which I thought was so cool because that's something I associate with like wine tasting, right? Precisely. You had this wonderful sort of wide variety of beet colors, Mm -hmm. like dark reds and some really brilliant yellows and some white beets in there. I chose the varieties um, to represent a range of the flavors that we know. So there was a, a wide range of earthiness in there because that's a quality that I'm measuring on everything that I'm studying and a, a range of sweetness also a range of things that I'm not measuring in the lab, but that have been perceived to be different, like bitter, harsh, uh, things like that. So basically, we tried to get a wide range of the flavors that are present in beet in those eight samples. The first thing I asked the chefs to do was just to describe them. So smell the thing and write down, what does this remind you of for the aroma, then the flavor and texture? Um, The flavor groups that are generally used to describe beet are uh, sweet, earthy, bitter, and harsh. So those are kind of the main elements. But within that, like there were 10 chefs that did the survey. I've entered three and a half surveys so far, and I'm at 128 different descriptors, (laughs) which is amazing because within... uh, Within the earthy category, I have riverbed, wet leaves, wet soil, um, things like that. Within sweet, everything from cotton candy to apricot. I love the idea of describing a flavor as wet leaves. Right? Yeah. Because <laughs> it's also something that comes out in wine tasting, too, like mm-hmm. forest floor. Yes. And those kinds of ideas. So, But you also had you know, that range of color. And we talked a little bit on the day about how color affects your expectations for flavor. Right. So generally, research has found that when people see an intense color, they expect more intense flavor. When people see a lack of color, like in a white beet, or a light color, they expect mild flavor. Um, And in a lot of cases, their liking of that food is based on whether their expectations are met or their expectations are contradicted. Julie, in some of the tastings that you've done, have there been things that have really surprised you? Like either that I can't believe they couldn't tell the difference of these or like I can't believe this one was so popular. I didn't think anybody would love it. There have been a few things like that. I think we were expecting there to be a lot more divergence in the chef's preferences, but we're seeing often they like the same ones and they dislike the same ones, but they'll describe them differently or... They may be looking for something unique, and so there'll be one chef that's really excited about something that's kind of out of the scope of what they expect, like the dry cucumber, and other chefs are looking for something that's going to appeal to a wider range of their customers, so they tend to prefer ones more in the middle of the pack. But personally, they will get excited about the same ones. So we ask the chefs to tell us what the flavor intensity is that they're perceiving. If they would buy something for their restaurant, their level of preference for that variety. Personal. Their personal preference. And then 
how easy they think it would be to use it in the kitchen or how it would work in their kitchen because there are sometimes vegetables that taste really good but have shapes or sizes that are challenging to fit into a commercial kitchen. Sometimes the preference and the yes I would buy this for my restaurant don't entirely match but they're both interesting things to collect because if it's a high level of preference but the reason they wouldn't buy it is because the shape is wrong the breeder can probably fix that. So for example, we had some peppers with the top that was indented. So think of a bell pepper where the stem is kind of sunk. That is much harder to chop up than one that the shoulders are rounded. Round shoulders also help farmers because in the Midwest we get rain in the summer. And so rain can collect in that indentation and rot out the middle of the pepper. That totally happened to some of my peppers this year. I, f I feel validated. <laughs> Yeah, so if you have those curved shoulders that kind of shed water, it also helps the chefs process them in the kitchen. So if you get one that is really excellent for flavor but doesn't quite have that right shape, that's something that breeders can work on um, with the right crosses and selection. Sometimes breeders just need to know that chefs want a certain shape or a certain size in order to start looking for that. Um, there's an example from Michael Mazurik in New York where he is breeding acorn squash and the chef said, well, what we really want is something with no ridges. We want it to be round because it's easier to process. And he said, well, basically I've been throwing all of those out because I thought everybody wanted ridges. But it's something that naturally exists in that crop and is easy to select for if we know that chefs want that. Another example is Bill Tracy is working on sweet corn. He's the sweet corn breeder at UW-Madison. And most of the market for sweet corn wants sweeter and sweeter varieties to eat fresh off the cob. Chefs often want to use sweet corn in other dishes besides just on the cob. And for that, you need something that will hold up to different preparations. They also want something with more corn flavor rather than just the sweetness. And so Bill has been working on culinary corn that you eat as a vegetable, but that isn't super, super sweet and has a little more texture and substance. And so that's something where knowing what the chefs would like to see allows him to select for that and deliver a variety that will do well in their kitchen and will also do well for farmers in Wisconsin because we're growing them out and testing them here, um, both in breeding nurseries and on farms. The Corner Table is sponsored by the Cap Times Idea Fest, an event with an exciting lineup of guests, including David Axelrod. The fest is in Madison on September 28th and 29th. You can find tickets at captimesideafest.com. I wondered about the preference thing when I went to the squash tasting because I immediately personally, because I, I tasted all the squashes and I was like, okay, there, a couple of these I just really love. And they were the sweeter ones because they're prepped really simply, right? You just you steam them and maybe a little bit of salt or something, right? Or olive oil maybe if right. necessary. But it's really, really simple prep. And like beets have tons of flavor all by themselves, but not everything does. <laughs> and I, I remember sort of thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gravitating toward, you know, these squashes that just have tons of sugar. And Johnny Hunter from, you know, Underground Food Collective was there and he didn't, he did not gravitate toward the same squashes that I did. He was looking at like, oh my gosh, this one that has less sweetness, but more of this other character I could use in so many different ways. I could use in more interesting ways. Mm -hmm. So he's seeing it sort of as a building block where my imagination was stopping sooner. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why working with the chefs has been really valuable because there has been some research that shows that if you're tasting things in small quantities, generally people gravitate towards the sweetest one. But if you have a whole plate of it, if you're eating it for a meal or if you're eating it over the course of many days, you no longer prefer the sweetest one. You might prefer something with a little more complexity. 
the chefs can really do that on the first go round and see what's possible with the different varieties and what they would use them for and how they would taste in a whole meal. And so we're really using their expertise to help overcome that tendency to just gravitate towards sugar and get more description of what actually the flavor is like. It's a great example of that last season about this time when I was uh, making selections from this participatory breeding population. I had a population that was uh, low jasmine, so very mild, but uh, in a lot of different colors. And I picked out uh, several families that were white roots with green tops. They looked really plain. Uh, it had very nice sweet flavor, but, you know, not a lot of earthiness. Uh, and I thought, I'm going to put this out there. I bet they won't like it. I bet the chefs will think it's boring. And they loved it. It was their favorite one because they said, like, it, it, it's, it's a palette for other uh, light flavors that might otherwise be overwhelmed by the stronger flavors in beet. So it could pair with celery or rose water, um, which is exactly the kind of thing you're talking about. Like they, they can take this flavor that they're tasting and say, how would this play with other things? One of the chefs I spoke with said that he loved being part of this process in part because he felt like he had a little bit more power or say, I guess, not power exactly, but, mm-hmm. but having a voice earlier on versus like just getting whatever you get, whether it's from the market or from the back of a Cisco truck, you're working with the product that you've got. He said, you often get something and you think, okay, well, how could I fix this? But when you're this far back, you know, they have, they have more of a, a voice or a different kind of, of input in what those vegetables might look like. I think with the whole project, we're trying to bring more voices into the decisions that get made about what we're going to eat five or 10 years from now. Um, Bill Tracy likes to say that having a diversity of decision makers is a good thing. I think we need to have not just the plant breeders deciding, but also the end consumers and the farmers that are growing those varieties or will be growing those varieties. We've seen a lot of consolidation in the seed industry up until now and with Um, the growth of the organic market and the local food market, we're starting to see a diversification again where we have many small seed companies serving regional markets. And that really gives us an opportunity to go from a few people making decisions about what seed will be available to many people making decisions about what we're going to have to plant and to eat in the future. That can drive innovation in cuisine itself. I was talking to Francesca Hong last fall uh, from Morris Ramen, and she was talking about how she, you know, she's a little bit limited in some of the things that she buys at the farmer's market because we have such a Germanic culture. Like, you know, there's there's all these sort of things that are influenced by Scandinavian, Norwegian, like cuisine and cooking, and farmers are growing it because that's the culture that we've had. And so she's been really, like, she'll buy, like, big things of bok choy from a farmer, but then there's not always a ton of other options that, that would work with her cuisine. But it seems to me that as these kinds of projects move forward, you can start to see, like, oh, these are the kind of cucumbers you would cook versus the kind that you would leave raw or a turnip that you right. would not cook. right. And what came to mind as Julie was talking is that I should probably say that for for this participatory beet breeding project that I'm doing, before we even get to the chefs, we ask the farmers um, what they want to see in a beet that they're growing. So I I did an online survey. uh, I got responses from, I think, 29 farmers that are collaborating with Julie and the Seed to Kitchen Collaborative um, who grow beets and told me what things were most important in the beets that they grow. And perhaps not surprisingly, the things that were most important were the things that would make a beet um, easy to grow in an organic system here. So strong germination, uh, strong top growth to outcompete weeds, and disease resistance. So the first step is to find things that grow well here. And then from those, find the things that taste great and you know are appealing to chefs and then appealing to the public. So coming up pretty soon, you've got a couple of things. Do you want to tell folks about what they are? Sure. On September 26th in the evening, Julie can tell the exact time, (laughs) we will be having a farm to flavor event, which is a chance for breeders to get paired with local chefs to uh, present a small plate dish 
made with uh, the things that those breeders are um, are selecting for for and with our local consumers. Yeah, so the Farm to Flavor Dinner we do every year at the end of the season to really celebrate some of the work that's gone into the project, put the chefs front and center for uh, an evening where they will prepare some of the, the varieties that have come out best in the trials, both on the production side and on the flavor side. And so this year it's 6.30 to 8.30 at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery on September 26th. Um, we have a panel of plant breeders, farmers, and chefs to talk about some of the work that we've been doing. And we also have a lot of chefs who have been participating in the tastings every month who will be featuring kind of their favorite variety from the project. So is it like a full meal, like a full dinner? It's small plates, but you probably will not go home hung- hungry. And while, while people are between small plates of delicious dishes from the chefs, um, they can try some beets with the flavor wheel that will have been constructed by then um, from the input that we started gathering last week at the tasting. So that'll be fun. They'll have the first first chance to use the flavor wheel to describe what they're tasting. See if people are perceiving similar or different things in the in the varieties that we're, that we're breeding. That sounds so much fun. Yeah. Yeah, we're also branching out a little bit this year, and we'll have some wheat varieties that we're in a trial that uh, Madison Sourdough will be baking with. We have hard cider and probably some fruit from the cranberry and grape programs in the horticulture department. Well, thank you both so much for coming in today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. This has been The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison, Wisconsin, produced by the Capital Times. Our music was composed by Patrick Christians, and this episode was edited by Eric Lawrenson. Find out more about the Seed to Kitchen project and that Farm to Flavor dinner on September 26th at our website, captimes.com. If you're into it, subscribe to The Corner Table on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Cap Times food writer Lindsay Christians. I personally love this sweet, earthy, tangy thing going on in pickled beets, so that is my recommendation and my wish for you this week. Cheers! The Corner Table has been brought to you by the Cap Times Idea Fest. Two days of lively discussion on September 28th and 29th on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. You can find tickets at captimesideafest.com.